So the recorder is on. I'm checking the audio is good. The video is good too. So uh, first thing first, okay. So I'm scheduling exam two to be on next Wednesday. So that's going to be the eighth of November.、Um, the topics would include everything, starting with relations,、uh, through the CNF stuff. You know.、Um, um, Propositional logic, and I cannot remember. There's probably one more thing that I forgot. Okay, so let's go. Let me let me give you guys you know, the、uh, practice exam from last semester because that will give you an idea of what happened last semester.、Um, I did the same thing with my three ten class.、Uh, in case you guys do not know, you know you can actually go to calendar feed so that you can integrate you know everything from Canvas into your mobile device. Um, it can be very busy depending on you know how many items your other classes have,、um, but I think it is handy that you can use a single calendar on your mobile device to kind of keep track of your know, all the homework assignments, all the exams, you know everything that is on Canvas.、Um, it may not help too much you know if your professors are not using、uh, Canvas you know to kind of track you know things that need to happen in the class, but at least the homework assignments will be tracked that way. <clears throat> All right, so let me go to announcement and give you guys you know the practice exam for exam two. So this way, you know, on Wednesday, on this Wednesday, when I talk about it, you know, on the first of November, you guys you know, can also have it available. It's going to be helpful if you study a little bit ahead of time and try to answer the questions in the exam,、um, because you know that's going to be. I think that will help with our discussion. Attach. So that's all I need to say here. All right. So we'll go to DISP four forty one two two three x two x three. Oh, okay. Three three x two dash zero 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 dot PDF. There we go. Publish. There you have it. So this is a, <clears throat> a representation of the exam from last semester. So looking at the scope here, we have relation questions, relation questions, relation questions, relation question. This is a CNF question, you know,、uh, related to propositional logic, and then this one is also propositional logic. So there are two main topics in exam two. Uh, namely, your know, relations, and also propositional logic. Yep. So no capping or discrete、uh, probability.、Yeah. That is correct. No counting, no discrete probability in exam two. So they will all be in the final exam. <laughs> yes. So in this case, if we if we use everything that we actually learn, it will be similar to the exam we're. I cannot make any statement regarding that because I really do not know the questions that I'll be asking for your exam two, so I can only tell you that the scope is going to be similar to exam two from the previous semester, but in terms of the format of the question, you know that I have not decided yet.、Mm -hmm. All right, <clears throat> so there's that. So one thing you can do is to basically go over. Uh, the this particular exam two, and try to answer these questions as much as you can、um, before Wednesday, so that on Wednesday when I go over the actual answers, you know then you guys can go like okay I got this one I got this one but I when I was working on this one I got a question then you can ask the questions in class. All right, so this is something that you can do. It does not count for any grade, but it is going to be useful. So、I'm going to close that one, and then we go back to、um, complexity, time complexity. Yes. Yes. So I'm double checking to make sure that the screen is good, that the audio is good, and it is definitely recording. Yep. Thank you for checking. So we're going to go to big omega. You know,、um, well, big O is omicron. This is omega, and this is theta. So that's where we、uh, 
were at last time. So these are all basically gone. So let me close the ones that I don't need anymore. Counting, yep. All right, oh, so all of that stuff is pretty old. <clears throat> so we'll start with this one. So there are a lot of notations, a lot of definitions, and you guys know what to do when we talk about definitions. Um, but this one is a little bit different. Um, it's difficult for me to ask questions about your know, time complexity, not in the usual format that I do. So um, I have to kind of work on that a little bit. But last time we talked about you know, how you, we only care about the fastest growing component when we look at an you know, actual function that computes the amount of time. Like in this case, okay, if you look at f of n, we can see there's a constant here, t1. It does not depend on n at all. So when n is large, t1 is usually negligible. Uh, t2 is you know, a multiplier to n, so when n gets larger, you know, this entire product is going to get larger and larger. But n squared times t3 is going to grow even faster because it is proportional to n squared. So from the perspective of comparing algorithms, um, you know, it is the, large, the fastest growing component that is the most important. So in this particular case, it is the n squared component that is the most important. So uh, that basically kind of concluded, you know, what we talked about on last Wednesday. Um, I also kind of talked about um, the traveling salesman problem, or MP complete as a class of problems. Um, that is outside of the scope of this particular module, which does not mean that those topics are not important, okay? Because MP completeness is a big topic in um, algorithm analysis. So you know, when you move on to a four-year university, depending on the program of the university, you may have you know, some additional classes like one or two that has a heavy emphasis on mathematics like this. So today's you know, topic is about asymptotic characteristics. Okay, so we're gonna look up this word first. Okay, what does that mean? <clears throat> so asymptotic, has to do with of referring to an abs as asymptote, asymptote of a function series approaching a given value or condition as a variable or as an expression containing a variable approaching a limit, usually infinity. Okay, what does that mean? And you know, this is the reason why we have pre-calc as a prerequisite of this class, because I believe in pre-calc, which is math two, uh, 372, they talk about limits. Is that correct? Okay, all right. So we're gonna have to look at some of those concepts, even though this is not a calculus class, it is still important to take a look to, to take a look at those concepts. So during this entire discussion, f of n is the actual time complexity of an algorithm. In other words, f of n is computing the exact amount of time on a particular computer to execute a particular algorithm. Is that okay? So it is exact. That means you know, f of n can be very complex, okay, with a lot of you know, numbers and, and whatnot. <clears throat> Most of the time, we don't care about the exact amount of time. We just need to know how fast the amount of time f of n, how fast does it change with n, okay? That's the only thing that we really care about. So what we'll do is we're gonna use g of n to represent an approximation of the time complexity of an algorithm. So f of n is the exact, g of n is a, it's just an approximation. Let me give you an example of what an approximation may look like. So in the case that we saw here, f of n being t1 plus n times t2 times n squared times t3, the approximation g of n can simply be n squared. We do not even mention there's a constant component we don't even mention that there is a you know, linear component. We don't even care about T3 itself. We just say that it's n, n squared, okay? Because that is sufficient already. We'll see why that is going to be sufficient already. But before we go there, we have to kind of understand a few kind of obscure terms, okay? So we'll describe these as obscure terms, obscure terms. The first one is called supremum, okay? So we want to take a look at the definition of supremum, 
So as every time we talk about you know, definitions, one thing you might want to do is to take note of the definition and make sure that you understand the actual mathematical definition of the, of the whole thing, you know, of the concept, and then be able to relate the concept to you know, actual things that we, are, that we care about. So we have a set A, which is a partial order or a set that is partially ordered. So we know a lot of things that are partially ordered. Integers are partially ordered, okay? Because every single integer relates to another integer using the less than or equal to or greater than or equal to relation that match all the requirements to be partially ordered. So just to help you study for the exam you know, for next Wednesday, what is partially ordered? What do we need in a relation for the relation to be classified as partially ordered? Okay, so what, what are some of those properties of a relation that we have talked about already? Let's start with a reflexive, okay, you know. <clears throat> so is reflexive, you know, a necessary condition in order for a relation to be partially ordered? Okay, for those of you who are nodding, you're correct, okay? And for those of you who are thinking, I have no recollection of that entire discussion, it's okay, it is in the modules. The question is, do you know which module, in which module we talked about, you know, um, reflexive as a property of a relation? So that becomes a question that you should answer, okay, because you, know, you should be able to answer that question. Where do I find the definition of you know, re ref reflexive as a property of a relation? Okay, so reflexive is necessary, okay? So now the question is, is less than or equal to going to be reflexive? for integers. <clears throat> what does it take to be reflexive? Every member in the set has to relate to itself using the relation. So the question is, is every integer less than or equal to itself? Seems to make sense. After all, less than or equal to spells out or equal to, which means you know, a number, you know, an integer is always relating to itself. The next one is um, anti-symmetric. So you have to look up what is anti-symmetric. It is one of the trickier um, qualifications of a relation. So you have to look it up. And I'm just going to tell you that less than or equal to is <coughs> anti-symmetric. Okay. The third one is transitive. So the question is, is less than or equal to the normal understanding of it? Is it transitive? If I say A is less than or equal to B, and B is less than or equal to C, does that imply A is less than or equal to C? What do you think? It is. Okay, that implication holds for integers. Okay, you know, it, it makes sense, right? If A is less than or equal to B, and B is less than or equal to C, that implies A is less than or equal to C. Okay? So that means, you know, less than or equal to is a relation that is partially ordered, you know, or it, this relation defined over uh, the set of integers is partially ordered, okay? So in order to define supremum, the only thing we need is partially ordered. So if, um, if a particular relation defined over a set is totally ordered, we go like, well, that's great, but it's not even needed because we just need partially order in this case. We don't even need totally order. But anything that's totally ordered is automatically partially ordered. So we go like, yeah, we would take those two. Okay, so real numbers, integers, those are, you know, those are all totally ordered um, with the less than or equal to relation. So the next thing we do is we define a set X that is a subset of the set A, okay? So we can see this is a subset, it's not proper subset of, which means X and A can be the same. Which means X is, you know, has some of the values of A, maybe all of that, maybe part of it, maybe none of that, because you know, if X is an empty set, it is still considered a subset of A when A is not empty itself. We'll define the predicate of P of Y X, Y is in lowercase, X is in uppercase, equals to for all x, lowercase x, in uppercase x, x is less than or equal to y. So this is how we define the predicate 
which is, which is just a fancy name of a function that returns a Boolean value, true or false. So this is how we define the, the predicate p, y, x, okay? So in this case, the predicate p, y, x means that y is, the, y is an upper bound of x, which means you can have more than just one upper bound for x here, okay? So this predicate just simply says whether y is an upper bound of x. It doesn't suggest anything like, oh, this is the upper bound of x. It simply asks the question, is this particular value an upper bound of x? <clears throat> so we're going to define you know, the su supremum now. Uh, we define lowercase s is the supremum of x, but s is the supremum of x if and only if blah, 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 blah is true. So this is when we need to kind of slow down and really take a look at this and go like, do we really understand what that means? Okay, do we understand what this entire thing is trying to say? All right, so we're going to take a Dive, deep dive into that particular statement, particularly this one here, and then we try to ask, what does that really mean? So we start with the overall operator, which is just a conjunction. All that means is, okay, P of SX has to be true. In other words, lowercase x, S has to be A upper bound of the set X. Okay, that seems to be easy to understand, which means you know, S has to be greater than every single element in X but S itself does not have to be in the set X, okay? So you have to keep in mind, there's nothing that we define out here that suggests that Y has to be an element of X as well. Y can be outside of the set X. Okay, what about the other side? The other, the other side of the conjunction here. It says for all the S prime, P of S prime of X, which means if S prime is also an upper bound of x, it would imply that s is lower is less than or equal to s prime. What does that mean? Hmm. Well, let's let's go over this again, right? So the first part is pretty easy. You know, lowercase s is an upper bound of x. We got that. <clears throat> the second one basically says, if S prime is a upper bound of X, then we also want to make sure that S is less than or equal to S prime. So, what is the easier way to say this? It's the next sentence, by the way. Yep. S is a minimum upper bound of X. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, this basically is the mathematical way to say that you know lowercase s here if it is called the supremum of x it is the minimum upper bound of x there cannot exist another lower bound that is less than s is that okay all right so know that you know sup x you know the supremum of x may be different from the maximum of x this is because supremum need not be an element of x, but the maximum needs to be an element of x. Okay? Yes, you got so, your hand up. So what's the relationship between s and s prime? s and s prime? Yes. So s prime, you know, every single s prime here is representing a upper bound of x. Okay. So, you know, there can be an infinite number of elements, you know, outside of x that are upper bounds of x. But we want S to be the smallest of all the upper bounds. So we want S to be less than or equal to every upper bound of X, meaning that S is the smallest of all the upper bounds. <clears throat> all right. So here's the trick of understanding this whole thing. Since we are usually using you know, the set of integers or the set of real numbers for A, that means you know, the, the supreme number of x really is the same thing as the maximum of x. We're just finding the maximum of the set. Is that okay? So even though the definition takes us you know, on a scenic route, okay, because you know, uh, x or a in this case, they're usually a set of real numbers or integers which are totally ordered. 
So with a set that is totally ordered, then the supremum is, is basically the same thing as the maximum. So that makes it a little bit easier to understand because you know, we all, hopefully, at this point of your you know, um, education, you know, the concept of a maximum of a set of numbers you know, should be fairly intuitive by this point. Is that okay? All right. So are we all good with uh, supremum is basically the same thing as the maximum? All right. So moving on to infimum, which is basically the same thing as a minimum. Okay. So infimum is basically the mirror image of a supremum where, you know, the definition is almost exactly the same, except it's opposite. Okay. So that means, you know, Q of IX, you know, basically states that I is A infimum of x, or is a lower bound of x, i is a lower bound of x, but we also want to make sure that every other lower bound of x to be less than um, or equal to the one that we're looking at, so that means i is the maximum of all the lower bounds. Now because, you know, once again, because x is likely to be a set of integers or real numbers, so that means, you know, the uh, infimum is usually just the minimum, okay? Fancy word, okay? Super fancy word, super fancy definition. So from your perspective, it really is just minimum. So we got maximum and minimum. Are we doing okay so far? So this is something that you might want to jot down, you know, because, you know, if you are looking at supremum as the maximum and looking at the infimum as the minimum, that makes the rest of the material really a whole lot easier to understand. So now we move on to the limit of a sequence. Okay, so this part is going back to a concept that you have learned in, C in Math 372, which is the concept of a limit. So what we're going to say is, what is the limit of a sequence of numbers? So we are looking at a sequence of numbers. So we have a, a sequence of numbers, you know, x0, x1, all the way up to x whatever, okay? In other words, the sequence just keeps going and going. So you can probably, you're probably curious about, so what exactly is the value of x0? What is the exact value of x1? We don't care, okay? We just know that we have an infinitely large array, and we are trying to find out what is this, okay? So we are, we are looking at the limit when i approaches infinity, what is the value of x of i? What does it mean when we say that the limit of this expression here is k? That is what we are investigating. So I'm going to pause a little bit here to see if there are any questions. Any questions? Okay, so I'm going to say that one more time. <clears throat> we, are really we are trying to answer the question of what does it mean when I say, you know, the limit of, as I approaches infinity, the limit of x of i is k. What does that mean? Okay. So what it means is this expression here. Okay. So we'll take a look at this kind of rather obscure you know, expression that's kind of long and big and stuff like that. But it really should be something that's familiar to you already because of your exposure to at least math 372. Many of you have taken other calculus classes already, so this really should be something that you go like, yeah, I've seen that before, I know what that means. All right, so we'll start with this, okay? We'll start with epsilon. Epsilon is an element of the real number set, which means epsilon is just a real number. It is greater than zero, okay? So we know it's not negative, it cannot be zero, but it can be tiny, okay? It can be 0.000001, okay? But you get to kind of choose which one you look at, okay? Just give me a value of epsilon as long as it is a real number. It's greater than zero. We'll, we'll work out the rest. Is that okay? Okay. So what about the rest? What are we trying to do? Well, we say that that has to exist an M as a natural number. Okay? So no matter how small of an epsilon you're giving me, there has to exist a natural number m such that, okay, such that what? Uh, such that, you know, for every j that is a natural number that is greater than or equal to m, this thing has to be true. What is that thing? 
that thing is k minus x of j, the absolute value of that has to be less than epsilon. Okay? Does that remind you of something that you have learned in math 372 or calculus in general? Maybe a little bit, okay? Maybe just a little bit, okay? Because when you first understand what is the derivative of uh, of curve, okay? You have your epsilon and you have delta and all kinds of stuff like that. This one is not quite like that, but it does borrow the same kind of concept, okay? So the long way of saying this is, okay, I'm going to say that <clears throat> for every epsilon that is greater than zero, and F1 being a real number, there has to exist an M such that, you know, all the um, X of J, where J is greater than or equal to M, between the difference between K, which is the limit, minus X of J, the absolute value, has to be less than epsilon. Is that okay so far? I mean, conceptually, is it okay? Okay, so we'll we'll we'll, we'll make a concrete you know, case so that it becomes easier to digest. Okay, so I'm going to use um, a more concrete case on the tablet, and this time we'll actually define you know what is x of something. Okay, so we'll just say that we define x of i to be two plus one divided by i. Don't ask me why this is how I define x of i, it just is. Is that okay? Um, okay, maybe that won't work. Plus one. Because otherwise x of zero is undefined, so we're going to say x plus one over here. All right, so if that is the case, you know, what is x of zero? x zero would be two plus one divided by zero plus one, which is 2 plus 1, which is 3. x1 is going to be 2 plus 1 divided by 1 plus 1, uh, which is 2 plus 1 half, which is just you know, 2 and a half, and so on. So we're doing OK so far with you know, the definition of x of i. So once again, don't ask me why I define x of i like this. It's, it's, it's just an example to illustrate the concept. Okay. So now, knowing how x of i is defined, the question is, if I say, you know, limit i approaches infinity, x of i, what do you think is the answer? Yep. Zero. Sorry? Zero. Two. Okay, two is the correct answer. <clears throat> okay. So the question is, okay, there are a few questions that we kind of want to answer in order to clarify the concept. So do you think one of these x something is going to be two itself? No, okay? None of them is going to be exactly two, but they can get really close, right? So if I were to go back to the definition and I choose epsilon to be, oh, I don't know, point, you know, point zero, 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 one, I make it really small, okay? The question is, can you find me an M such that X of M is the K minus you know, X of M is going to be less than epsilon K of X subscript M plus one, you know, absolute value is less than epsilon and so on. Can you find me that particular M? The answer is, yeah. You can use algebra, right? You just use algebra to figure out, okay, you know, I can use algebra to figure out what this M has to be. But you can find it, right? You know, the whole point is that M exists, okay? From X of M, X of M plus 1, X of M plus 2, they are all within this amount from 2. Now, which side of 2? We don't even care because you know, it says you know, take the absolute value. Is that okay so far? So this is how we define the limit of a sequence. We basically, it's really just asking if I expand, if I use i as the index and say that i is approaching, approaching infinity, what is the value of x of i as i approaches infinity? Where does, does it converge 
to a specific value. That is basically what it's asking. All right? <clears throat> so we go back to the notes here, okay? It's basically you know, talking about the same thing, but then there are certain things you know, where the limit does not exist. So this is one of those examples. If I define x of i to be negative 1 to the power of i, then the limit does not exist. What does it mean when the limit does not exist? It means I cannot make this true anymore. I cannot find, I cannot make this entire thing true anymore. Why not? Because you know, in the case of x of i is negative 1 to the power of i, then it just alternates between 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1. Okay? So that means, hey, if I give you an epsilon of 0.2, you cannot find me that m anymore. Does that make sense? Because no matter what number you choose to be the k, okay, to be the, the actual limit, it's gonna the difference between that number and the alternating one, the negative one, is gonna exceed whatever epsilon I have chosen, which is 0.2 in this case. So since you know, this particular statement is false, it means you know, it does not have a limit in this case. Yep. So in that case, well, we'll see, okay, you know, because, you know, there are other ways to define, you know, uh, the asymptotic you know, behavior of a, of a sequence, so we'll take a look at those two. <clears throat> the, the, the short answer to your question is yes, infinity is one of the potential answers of a limit. Okay, which is explained out here, you know, if the limit of a particular sequence is infinity, that means, you know, for all y that is a real number, there exists an m in n, such, you know, which is a, the natural number, such that, you know, as long as j is greater than or equal to m, then, um, and it's a natural number, then x of i is greater than, x of j, sorry, x of j is greater than y. So that's how you know this. That's basically what it means when we say the limit of a sequence is infinity. It's no matter how large of a value y you choose, I can guarantee that if you look at look at a particular point in the sequence and beyond that point, all the numbers in the sequence is going to be greater than y. You can pick y to be an even larger number. I just find your different M, and the same thing happens. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> All right, so now we talk about, you know, the concept of a limit superior. So when we look at limit superior, which has the abbreviation of lim sup, um, of a sequence of numbers, this is how we define it. Now, this one is a little bit trickier to look at because it is nested, okay? Because what it is really doing is it's finding the infimum of a set of supremum. So each supremum is changing a little bit. They're different from each other by one little thing. What k are we choosing? Okay. So let's read this thing, you know, from the from the from the innermost part and then we expand out. So the first thing is, um, what is the set notation? at the innermost portion here, okay? So the innermost portion here is to say, if you give me an n, okay, give me some n, which is a natural number, um, I am going to give you the supremum, which is the same thing as the maximum. I'm, give you the, I'm giving you the maximum of all the, uh, of all the numbers in the sequence where the index of the number or the index of the element is greater than or equal to n, okay? What does that mean? So from the from a graph perspective, okay, so let me give you a graph perspective here. So we are just going to define a graph, okay, hypothetical. And we are just going to make it go up and down a little bit here and then some more here and so on, okay? So if n, so this part here is n, and this is the value of x of n, 
Is that okay? Sort of, okay. <clears throat> and it's just a natural number. So in, in terms of the horizontal axis, it is just a natural number. So this whole thing is discrete, okay? It's not continuous. <clears throat> so we are just gonna assume that you know, everything beyond this line is gonna stay at that value. We'll just make that assumption. Okay. So if I were to ask you at this point here, what is the, um, okay, let me go back to the notes. I think it is the supremum, okay? So at this point, what is the supremum? Well, the supremum is asking, what is the maximum of everything from the point that I'm interested in and past that, okay? So you go like, well, if we are assuming that everything at this point is just going to be a flat line at this particular value, this looks like it's going to be its own, you know, maximum, okay? So at this point here, the maximum is right here. Let me give, try another point here. Let's try this point here, okay? So what do you think is the supremum when n equals to this point right here? Yep. That first point where like the first Same thing, right? Yeah. yeah, because we are asking what is the maximum value of all the values past this particular point? So, okay, we go like, uh, is the next point larger? Yep, it's the larger, 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 larger. So we get to this point, it becomes the maximum, but everything after that is not any larger. So that means, you know, from the perspective of this point here, the supremum is also this particular value. So that's going to stay the same, okay, until we get to, say, this point here. So if we look at that point, okay, so it's a little bit harder for me to find that point over here. There we go. So from this point's perspective, you know, you know, we look at the n value at that point, and then we ask, what is the supremum of all the values after this particular point? We go like, oh, it's gonna be that thing itself, right? Because you know, everything after this point they all have values that are less than the value at this point here. Is that okay? All right. So we basically just have a whole bunch of these maximum values. The only difference between the quote-unquote maximum values is from which point of the sequence do we start to look for the maximum? That's the only difference. Are we good okay? Are we okay so far? So I'll give you, okay, I'll give you some more examples and you can tell me where we are supposed to have the maximum. What about this point here, okay? If n is at this point here, where is, where do I find the supremum? Right, uh, right on the top here, right? Right here. So that means you know, the supremum is gonna be at this point, you know, when n equals to this particular value. Are we good so far? Okay. <clears throat> so in the end, what we are really asking, if we go back to the definition, okay, so all we are asking, so we now know, you know, what each of these, you know, maximum is. Remember, supremum is maximum because we are dealing with real numbers and integers. So we are looking at the maximum, you know, past a particular point. So the question is, what point are we talking about? Well, this infimum, this set notation for the infimum, which is the minimum, is basically saying, oh, you know, we just start with n equal to zero, then n equals one, then n equals two, then n equals three. So when you when we go back to this graph here, we're asking, what is the minimum of the maximums? So where do you think is the minimum of the maximums? Here, yeah. well, but it, once you get to here, okay, uh, yeah. yep, so that is the minimum of the maximums, okay. So I'm just gonna give, use a different color, okay, so that you know, we can kind of cross that over to the other side. So I'm gonna pick, uh, say, green. So I'm basically saying, you know, this, okay, this particular value is going to be our 
uh, limit superior. So I'm going to draw a, vert a horizontal line, okay, like this. Ah, okay, that's really crooked. Oh, I'm using the wrong keyboard. Okay, so let me draw a straight line because there's a straight line tool. So why not, why not use a straight line tool? Cool. When we just want to draw a straight line, okay. So I'm claiming, oh, it's not using the right color this time. Okay, try one more time. Okay, there we go. Oh, it changes with the tool again. Ugh. All right, straight line. And how do I know what color it's using? Oh, it has its own color specification. There we go. All right, so I'm claiming that this green line here is my limit superior. So what you need to do is to ask, does that make sense? I'm claiming the green line is the minimum of maximums, which means if you want to disprove that, all you need to do is to say, mm, no, I find a minimum, I find a maximum of this series that is actually less than the green line. So the question is, can you find that? But the red point is not. Hmm? That's red point is. Say that again? I was saying, uh, is the fourth peak, does the fourth peak not? The fourth peak? You mean this one here? No, the one below the Oh, you mean this one here? Yeah. Okay. So let's take a look at that, right? So if we say, okay, we'll consider, okay, turn it back to this pane here. So let's say we consider this one, okay? Let's say this is the end that we're looking at. So we are asking, what is the maximum from this point on? all the way to infinity, you know, what is the maximum of that, okay? So you start with this one, you go like, not bad, okay? We are on a downward trend here, and we are on an upward trend. So up to here, this value is indeed the maximum, right? But guess what? We are not going to stop there. We, we are not going to stop until we go through the entire thing, okay, which has an infinite length. So we keep going until we process this point over and go like, huh, it's not exactly just this value here, not this value. It is going to go up here. This becomes the maximum. So from the perspective of n being this, you know, I'm going to say n, <clears throat> n of i, n of i is fine. Okay. So from this point of view, the limit, uh, the actual supremum or the maximum from this point on is actually all the way up here. Does that make sense to you? Sorry, could you say that one more time? Sure. So let me let me use the equation you know, way of expressing that. So what I'm saying, okay, so if we go back to the expression, so what we are trying to say is soup and you know it's trying to find the maximum and we are using a soup of xk such that k is greater than or equal to n of i is, okay, I'm going to use a different line here and a different color so that I can you know, kind of emphasize what we're talking about. So we're going to use blue, and this is the blue. Um, Okay, that doesn't look too good. <clears throat> I'm gonna have to erase this little thing here. Okay. But the blue line is gonna be captioned as this value. So we'll say eh, give it a name, right? That's all I need to do is give it a name. So we'll just say this is my okay, maybe not a name. Maybe we just need to point it there. Okay, does that make sense? So I don't know exactly what is n of i, okay? We just know that it's some kind of natural number. And then we're asking, what is the maximum of all the values starting at x of n of i? So we are looking at this point, 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 
and then all the future points. But at this point here, after this, everything stays the same. So I don't have to really kind of consider that anymore. Is that okay? Does everybody see that the blue line is the supremum of x of k such that k is greater than or equal to n of i? If I look at all the values in the sequence starting at x of n of i, okay, because you know, this value here, this particular value, is x of n of i, the next one is n of x of i plus 1, and so on and so forth, and I want to find the maximum of all of those values, that will be the blue line. Is that okay? So it does not negate what I said earlier, okay, because what I said earlier is the lowest, okay, the, the smallest, the minimum of all, the, of all of these maximums is actually the green line, okay? So until some of, one of you can find me a maximum of these points all the way up to infinity that is less than the green line, what I said is still true. Is that okay so far? Okay. So, um, well, I can see a lot of tips, okay, that are dipping below the green line, like this guy over here. Okay. So if I try to find out what is the maximum starting from this point, well, guess what? I don't have to go that far. I can look at this thing here and go like, it's not less than the green line. So for what, for the purposes of disproving the green line is in fact the um, limit superior of the entire sequence, I can stop there. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so since you know, none of us can say you know, can find a maximum that is less than the green line, then the green line is the actual correct answer. It is the limit superior of this particular curve. Are we good so far? It is the minimum of the maximums. Can you do one in general? Hmm? Can you do one in general? Sure. I'll give you a, the fun example of the alternating one and one and negative ones, okay? <clears throat> All right, so in this case, we have square weights, right? You know, one and negative ones. And it keeps going like this forever, blah, 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 okay? Of course, in this case, I kind of have to give you guys where zero is, okay? This is actually zero, okay? <clears throat> So can someone tell me what is limit superior in this case? In other words, what is the minimum of all the maximums? It's one, okay? In other words, if, if I just draw a line here you know, with all the ones, that is my limit superior. Oh, wait, it is defined. It has a limit superior. And guess what? It also has a limit inferior. It overcame a problem that we had earlier. Even though the sequence does not have a limit, okay, it does not converge to a particular value because it keeps oscillating up and down you know, between one and negative one, I can still define the limit superior as well as the limit inferior. So as far as, you know, Describing the behavior of this particular sequence of numbers as you know the index goes on and on and on and on, I can I can still describe it. I can now say that it will not exceed one. I can also say that it will not be below negative one. That is still a useful description. I can still say it's going to oscillate within this envelope. So that is the reason why we define limit superior and limit inferior is we basically define an envelope of the behavior of the curve as the index goes on to infinity and beyond. I cannot do the Buzz Lightyear impersonation. I just cannot do that. Just cannot. But th that's the whole concept, okay? From here all the way to infinity, where is, what is my maximum? 
and then you look at all the maximums, and then you say, what is the minimum of all of those maximums? That is your limit superior. It defines the upper bound of the curve as the index goes on to infinity, as the index approaches infinity. Limit uh, inferior is exactly the same thing, except it's opposite, okay? Find all the minimums from different starting points, and then find the maximum of all of those minimums, and you know, that defines the uh, limit inferior, which is the lower bound of the behavior of this curve as the index approaches infinity. In other words, okay, if I were to sum this up in, a, in one single sentence, limit superior and limit inferior, you know, look, they define an envelope of the curve as the index approaches infinity. That's what it's doing. So instead of saying, oh, we're gonna have to convert to a single value, oh, give that up, it's not gonna work sometime. Instead of saying that they are converging to a single value, we just have to say, oh, they converge within this envelope that the index goes on to infinity. So is that okay? Does everybody see how this is a more flexible way to look at the uh, asymptotic behavior of a curve as the index goes, keep on going to infinity? Are we good so far? All right. <clears throat> So I can see certain ways to ask you know, questions about this because I can give you a particular definition of x of k, and then I can ask you, okay, you know, given that is the definition, what is the limit superior and also what is the limit inferior? In other words, you know, how do you define the envelope of the behavior of the curve as the index you know, approaches infinity? Now. Once you understand this concept, the other way to look at limit inferior and limit superior and how that, you know, that defines an envelope is for any sequence that actually has one particular value that it converges to, simply means that the envelope becomes a single point. So instead of saying, oh, this, you know, this sequence is gonna fluctuate between, you know, between this line, which is limit superior and limit inferior, you basically go like, they're the same thing. Limit superior and limit inferior are exactly the same thing. Then you have a limit. That particular sequence now has a limit because it's not fluctuating between you know, inside a particular envelope. Is that making any sense? Okay, all right. <clears throat> so now we can move on. Okay, so let me just pause here because I, I was assuming that people do not have any questions. Let me just kind of pause and see if there are any questions at this point. Yes? So, if limit <clears throat> superior and limit inferior is the same, then that is the limit. Then, that is the limit. then there's a limit. That is correct. Because basically your envelope is converging to a single value. So you don't have a range anymore because your limit inferior and your limit superior are exactly the same number. That number is the limit of the sequence, it, it has, it exists. The entire sequence has a limit in that case. All right, are we doing okay? All right, so remember the trick that I use to explain this concept is to use an example. And in the first example here, I made an assumption that you know, past this point, they're all gonna be the same value. Okay, because without that assumption, it's kind of hard to understand the concept. But with that assumption, it's easy to understand the concept. It's like, oh, okay, so everything past that point is going to be the same thing. All right. So now we get back to um, the next term, which is upper bound. Okay. So now, okay, and only now we start to relate to time complexity. Everything before this, okay, from section 3.1 to section 3.5 are really just defining the vocabulary that we need in order to explain what is the upper bound, you know, of a particular time complexity. <clears throat> so the upper bound is using what we call the big O notation. So when people say, oh, the big O of this particular algorithm is blah, 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 all they're doing is to define an upper bound which may not be 
desirable, okay? Because you can have an upper bound that is way overestimating the actual time complexity of an algorithm, okay? But we'll talk about that next, okay, a little bit later. So remember F and G, okay? F is the exact amount of, amount of time when the problem size is N. G, on the other hand, is like, okay, this is a way simplified version. And it's an estimate of the time complexity, okay? So keep that in mind. <clears throat> So when we say that G is an upper bound of F of N, G of N is an upper bound of F of N, this is what it means. Okay, so let's take a closer look at this. What is it really saying? So the first thing we know is, oh, there's, a, there's an element of notation, which means the big O notation <clears throat> is really a set concept, okay? We have a g of n here. g of n tend to be a, very, a really simple kind of function, like n, 1, n cubed, 2 to the power of n, n factorial, that sort of stuff, okay? So g of n is a very simple thing that is used to approximate f of n, which can have all kinds of crazy stuff in it, but it's exact. Are we doing okay so far? So we say that g of n is an upper bound of f of n, which is basically what this entire notation is trying to say, if and only if the limit superior as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of f of n divided by g of n is less than infinity. That is the qualification. <clears throat> Are we doing okay so far? So remember, one more time, f of n is the exact amount of time to run an algorithm with a problem size of n, g of n is just an approximation. So as long as this ratio is less than infinity, which means it can be zero, okay? It can be five, it can be 20,000, can be any actual fixed value. But as long as the limit superior, which is defining the upper bound of the envelope as the sequence, you know, continue on to forever. As long as this ratio is a particular number, including zero, then g of n can be seen as the upper bound of f of n. Okay, that's a lot of abstract stuff, you know, that I just throw at you. So the best way to understand this is, okay, can you give me an example? Okay, so we'll go ahead and take a look at a few examples, okay? <clears throat> All right, so I'm not switching yet here because I have to kind of write down you know, what f of n I want to use and what g of n I want to use. So I'm going to say f of n is, okay, we'll, we'll do some simple stuff first, okay? <clears throat> f of n is exactly n squared, and then g of n is also exactly n squared. Okay, so this is what we're looking at here. So now we want to look at the actual definition, okay, which is what is the limit superior of blah, 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 okay? Yo. So now we ask what is the limit superior as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of f of n divided by g of n, okay? What is that? <clears throat> you go like, is that a trick question? Because it looks awfully easy to me. Because f of n and g of n are exactly the same. So what do you think is f of n divided by g of n, regardless of n itself? One. It's just one. Okay, so limit superior, the whole thing boils down to one as n approaches infinity. You, go, you look at this equation here, it's like, okay, so you're asking me what is the <clears throat> long-term maximum, okay, that's one way to look at it, is long-term maximum of the constant of 1 that does not even depend on n. So what does that curve look like to you when the sequence looks like this? In other words, if I look at this as a sequence of x0, x1, x2, blah, 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 okay, what is x of i in this case? One. It's just 1. Okay. So when you look at the curve, what are you looking at? This is n, this is zero, this is one, this is two. This is the curve that we are looking at. 
but looking at the actual value, this is just one, right? We don't even care about what it is exactly. The only question is, is it infinity? One is not infinity, and guess what? F of n, in this case, is indeed, um, con you know, it, it is, g of n is the upper bound of f of n in this case, even though they are exactly the same thing. Okay, that doesn't seem too bad. Another, you know, example. f of n, which is the exact thing that we are looking for, is n. g of n is n squared. So now we do the same thing, okay? We basically look at, we are looking at the limit superior as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of f of n divided by g of n. We go like, well, we can simplify, okay? Because f of n divided by g of n is, okay, so I have to kind of repeat everything on the outside. <clears throat> but what we are looking at is that. Does that make sense to you? because of the way we define f of n and the way we define g of n, okay? So in this case, what do you think is the limit superior? It, it basically approaches zero. There's actually a limit, okay? But we look at the limit as, okay, that's a special case when limit superior and limit inferior are the same. So, but the bottom line is, the whole thing just boils down to zero. Is that infinity? No, okay. So we now say that g of n, which is n squared, is an upper bound of f of n, which is just n. Then you go like, wait, hold on a second here. That's not the context that I usually use the big O notation. The big O notation usually is an accurate description or approximation of the actual amount of time. If you are having that realization, congratulations, because that is actually what the Omicron of something means, okay? The big O thing is big Omicron, okay? It was one of the Greek symbols or Greek letters. Okay, so that is cool, okay? <clears throat> so now we go back here and go like, okay, so now we can, we know what is an upper bound, you know, as long as this ratio here is some number other than, you know, infinity itself, then we can still say that, you know, G of N is an upper bound of F of N. And this can be zero, okay? It can be zero. So now it is defining, you know, we define what is negligible. Now, typically in most literature that talks about, you know, the time complexity of algorithms, we usually do not talk about negligible, but it is still one of the definitions. So we'll just kind of go ahead and talk about it. This is the lower case of Omicron, or you can say little o. <clears throat> so we can now say that, you know, g of n is the upper bound of f of n, but it's negligible when the limit is a zero. When we look at the limit, now this time it is not limit superior, this time it really is limit, which means the limit does exist and it is zero. So in this case, we are basically saying, you know, G of N is basically a gross overestimate of G of N. So the example that we looked at, you know, just earlier, where F of N is N and G of N is N squared, that estimate is a gross overestimate. It's not very close to the actual thing, but is it an upper, is it an upper bound? Yeah, it is still an upper bound. It's just a very gross overestimate of the actual function f. So in this case, it's called uh, negligible. So now we talk about lower bound, and you can see that how lower bound is kind of, oh, it's just the flip side, okay? <clears throat> Because we say that g of n is the lower bound of f of n if and only if the limit inferior, which basically is talking about the lower part of the envelope, you know, as the sequence goes on and on and on and on, is greater than zero. It can be anything other than zero. Okay? So when f of n is n and g of n is n squared, it does not meet this requirement because in that case, the limit inferior is zero itself. Zero is not greater than zero. When f of n is n, g of n is also n, yeah, it's okay because one is greater than zero, not a problem. Um, what if we have it the opposite? Okay, so let me go <clears throat> take a look at a different example this time. 
So what if I were to define f of n to be, uh, let's pick something that we have not, you know, kind of looked at before. Let's say this is n factorial. And then we look at g of n, and we'll say this is n to the power of 30, okay, which is a pretty high power, okay, of n, okay. So now we ask the question, okay, what is the limit inferior this time as n approaches infinity? And we look at the absolute value. The, usually the absolute value operator is not really useful because we are both f, and, f of n and g of n are typically non-negative, which means there's no need to apply the absolute value. But, you know, that's part of the definition, so we'll keep it. So what do you think this looks like? Hmm. What do you think? <clears throat> so we know that n to the power of 30 grows pretty fast, right? You know, if n is 2, we're looking at 2 to the power of 30. When n is 3, we're looking at 3 to the power of 30. That grows pretty fast. And then you look at factorial and go like, well, it's, it's not that bad, right? You know, 1 factorial is 1, 2 factorial is 2, 3 factorial is 6, 4 factorial is what? 6 times 4 is 24, and then we have 120 and so on. So go like, I don't see how factorial is growing faster than n to the power of 30, but it is, okay? So the only question is, how do we know that? <clears throat> so I'm not going to give you the proof, okay, that n factorial is growing faster than you know, n to the power of 30, but the bottom line is, this is actually infinity. The limit inferior is infinity. Okay? So you look at this and go like, okay. So let's go back to the definition here. So can we still claim that g of n is a lower bound of f of n? In other words, can we claim that n to the power of 30 is a lower bound of n factorial? Well, is infinity greater than zero? Okay, well, then it goes. n to the power of 30 is a lower bound of n factorial. That's basically what it is. As long as this ratio here is not zero, okay, then we can say that n, we, we basically say that g of n is a lower bound of f of n. But is it a good lower bound? In other words, is it close to, you know, are these two functions close? The answer is no, it is not. <clears throat> because, you know, when we define dominant, we're basically looking at the same thing as negligible, except this time we're going in the opposite direction. We are basically looking at the limit, okay? This is not limit inferior, this is the actual limit. If the limit of this ratio is infinity, then we basically say g of n is a gross <coughs> underestimate of f of n. In other words, it's not useful. Is it an underestimate? Yes. Is it a useful one? No. Because it is gross. Okay? It is just under, un, way underestimating f of n. I mean, oh, do okay in terms of the terms and also in terms of how they are mathematically defined. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so section 3.10 is actually how most people understand the big O notation. So when people say the big O notation, they really meant to say big theta. Because the, the way we define big theta is g of n is the tight bound of f of n if and only if g of n is an, un, is an upper bound of f of n and g of n is also a lower bound of f of n. So when g of n is both an upper bound and a lower bound of f of n, then we call g of n a tight bound of f of n. That is when things are useful. Because now we can basically go like, okay, with the merge sort algorithm, it has a lot of components, okay? Some, you know, are you know, just linear to the size of the array. Some would be uh, just a constant, okay? Does not even depend on how many arrays you have. That would be the initialization, you know, stuff like that. And then we have one component that is n times log n, okay? So in that case, n log n is a tight bound. 
because it is both an upper bound and also a lower bound of the actual f of n. Okay, so let's uh, let me let me just illustrate what that means. Okay, here when we are, when we have a tight bound. <clears throat> So we're going to say, you know, f of n, in this case, is the actual time complexity running Mert sort on a particular computer is, okay, we'll just say there's a, some kind of constant of t0, there's some kind of t1 that we have to multiply with n, which is the size of the problem, plus, okay, uh, there's a t2, you know, which is multiplied to n times the log of n, and it doesn't matter which log we are talking about. It can be natural log, can be log two, because they're all. The only difference is a constant. Okay, so we, we don't really care which log we are talking about. It can be log two, it can be natural log, it can be log ten. They're all the same thing. Okay, so this is the actual f of n. <coughs> I can even plug in you know exact values. Okay, so we can say this is you know this is two, this is ten, and this is one hundred. Okay, just for the discussion, okay? All right, and then we now have g of n being just n times the log of n, okay? So now we ask the question, what is the limit uh, superior of the ratio? The limit superior as n approaches infinity of the ratio between f of n and g of n is what? Okay, so remember, limit superior is describing the up the higher end of the envelope as the sequence goes on and on and on and on. Okay, so in this case, what do you think is the limit superior as n approaches infinity? Would the two still be useful as n approaches infinity when n is really 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 large? Now the two is just going to be, you know, insignificant. Okay, how about the ten? How about this ten over here that we multiply to n? Well, even though you know log of n does not increase really fast, it still increases. You know, increases, right? So when you compare n versus the log n times the log of n, n times the log of n is still going to grow faster, which means you know this constant of ten is not going to be. Um, Significant because you know, when you look at the actual division, we end up with the log of n as the denominator, which means you're still dividing something with a number that keeps going up and up and up. And because n approaches infinity, that means you know, that term just kind of goes away. So that means you know this whole thing boils down to 100. Does that make sense to you? <clears throat> when n becomes really, 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 really large, okay, the actual Limit superior, which is basically the describing the upper end of the envelope, is just one hundred. Is that okay? Is everybody convinced? Now, if you're not convinced, you know you can actually you can make you can make examples to convince yourself. In other words, you use a spreadsheet, and then you just try out. Okay, what if n is one? What if n is two? And then you go increase n exponentially. And then you look at the ratio, and you will start to see, oh, okay, so when n gets really large, that ratio really just kind of converts to 100, okay? <clears throat> so now we look at limit inferior as n approaches infinity, same deal, okay? And what is it? The same thing, okay? Because in this case, we do not have a sequence that oscillates. So if a sequence is not oscillating, then limit superior and limit inferior is going to be the same thing, which is just the limit of the sequence, which in this case is also just 100. So now you ask the question, <clears throat> can we claim this? And this is a big O, big omicron. Can we claim that G of N is the upper bound of F of N? Okay, what does that mean again? Let's look it up. So when we say something is an upper bound, it means you know whatever that ratio is has to be less than infinity. It's 100 less than infinity. Okay, well, that meets that requirement. So now we ask the other question, which is, uh, do we have a lower bound here? In other words, we look at the limit inferior and we ask, is it 
greater than zero. Is one hundred greater than zero? Yes. Okay. So that means <clears throat> g of n is both serving as the upper bound as well as the lower bound of f of n, which means now we have a tight bound. Is that okay? So I'm just I'm just gonna pause here and see if those concepts are connecting in your mind. <clears throat> Well, let me ask a question in a in a slightly different way. Okay, so in a lot of literature, okay, you know, people say, oh, the big old notation thing, you know, of this particular algorithm is blah blah. Okay, so is that by itself, you know, a useful claim? Okay, in other words, okay, I'm going to say f of n is the actual time complexity of running. <clears throat> um, Merge sort on a specific computer. Okay, so this is merge sort. You know, I just want to emphasize that, and I'm going to say you know f of n is an element of big O of n squared. Okay, can I make that claim? Is that claim correct? What do you think? First of all, you know, according to what you know about merge sort, what is the actual time complexity of merge sort? Hmm? It's not n squared. <laughs> it is not n squared because n squared is poor for a sorting algorithm. What is it? What is the time complexity, the upper bound? Of a merge sort algorithm. Did you guys talk about that in 430? It's n log n. That is correct. Okay, it is n log n. So if f of n is n log n, okay, so f of n is some kind of t0 plus some linear portion that is proportional to t1 plus you know, some portion that is proportional to n log n, okay, and it's a constant, the coefficient is t2, this is f of n. So if this is f of n, and this is n squared here, can I claim that n squared is the upper bound of f of n? Okay, what, what, what do you think you get? Okay, look at the limit. In this case, it's not just limit uh, superior because it, it really is just a limit. So when, you, when we look at the limit of n approaching infinity, and then we are asking, okay, we look at the division, t0 plus n times you know, t1, plus n log n times t2, okay? This is the exact amount of time to run merge sort divided by g of n, which is n squared. What do you think is the answer here? <coughs> Come on, you guys, huh? Uh, it would be log n times t2 over n. Log n times t2. No, it's not, because it's going to be, okay, so let's break it up, okay? Because it is limit n approaches infinity, it's t0 divided by n squared plus t1 divided by n plus log of n divided by n times t2, right? So what do you, what do you think it is, okay? n is just going to become insanely large, okay? Oh, if n is going to be insanely large, n squared is going to be even more insanely large, right? So that means t0 divided by n squared just disappears, right? When n is insanely large, t1 divided by n just kind of goes away too. Okay, not a problem. What about the ratio between log of n divided by n itself? You just have to think about it, okay? <clears throat> Let's say we're talking about log of 2, okay? So what is the log of 2 of 1? Um, and you know this is 1 here. The log of 1 is 0. 1 is 1, so that's a 0. OK, that doesn't seem okay, irrelevant. What about n being 2? Log 2 of 2 is 1. Divided by 2 is 1 half. What if n is 4? Log 2 of 4 is 2. 
and then four is here, two divided by four is a half. It's one, you know, it's one five, and so on. So then you go like, okay, let's give a bunch of numbers. And what if n is 1024? When n is 1024, log two of 1024 is 10. And so now it is about 110, okay? This entire value is 110. Do you see a trend? What is the trend? Getting smaller and smaller. As n gets larger, this ratio gets smaller and smaller. So that means, hmm, I think we have a pretty good you know, intuition. This goes to zero too. So that means we have zero, zero, and zero over here, which means the entire thing just boil down to zero. Okay? Wait, does that mean g of n is can be considered as an upper bound of f of n? Okay, that's the question. Okay, but how do we answer that question? We do not just guess. We do not, we do not use the meaning of the English words to infer the answer. We look up the definition. So we go back to how we define upper bound, okay, blah, 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 upper bound, oh, 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 we just went past it, okay, so in this case, the limit superior is the limit itself because it's not oscillating, so we really is asking the question, is zero less than infinity? Yes, it is, okay, well, if it is, then I can make this claim. I can make this claim that when f of n is the time, com is the actual time complexity, of third sort, I can still claim that it is big O of n squared. Because n squared really is an upper bound. It is a gross overestimate, but it is still an upper bound. But it's a useless upper bound to me because if I look at, okay, I'm gonna use g of n. Okay, g of n is the time complexity of bubble sort. Okay, so we know g of n is n squared, right? So we can now say g of, n, g of n is also <clears throat> an element of big omicron of n squared. This conclusion does not help you find or use or choose the right algorithm. Because from the perspective of n squared is the upper bound of the time complexity of merge sort, it's also the upper bound of bubble sort, it doesn't give you any useful information. Because as far as you're concerned, if this is all you know, it's like, um, I can choose either one because I really cannot know which one is better. Is that making any sense? So that's why, you know, from here on, you really don't want to look at just big Omicron of something. You want to look at big theta of something. Unfortunately, a lot of times, okay, including textbooks at the college level, when big theta should be used, they use big omicron, which is the big O notation, which is also why you know you have heard about the big O notation. It's because people use it as if it is big theta. We wanted you know, to use big theta, but people use big O instead. So this you know, little differentiation, even though it sounds like, oh, tech, you're just splitting hair, which I'm very good at, okay? But it is important, okay? Because when you look at the definition, they are not exactly the same thing. They're just off by a little bit. Because in order to be big theta, the approximating function also need to be the lower bound. Then you have the upper bound and the lower bound being the same thing. You now have a tight bound, and that is useful. Are we doing okay? All right, okay. So we are running out of time today. Um, the recorder is still on, okay, that's a good thing. <clears throat> But on Wednesday, we are not going to continue with this topic here. Instead, we're going to talk about the um, exam two from the previous semester. So I'll be talking about the solution to that one that I just sent to you by announcement. So it would be very helpful if you guys can just kind of, you know, don't do it as if it is a real, real exam, okay? You know, just be, just go like, okay, I can look up things that I want to look up, my own notes, your tax modules and whatnot. Just try your best to answer all of those questions you know, to your best ability, because that will give you an assessment of how well you know the material. And if you do have any gaps, okay, you can ask questions on Wednesday as I go over those particular questions. So that's my recommendation, okay, you know, before Wednesday, you know, that's something you can do. You also have the homework assignment that's due, what? 
Monday, okay. So you know, don't forget about that one, okay. It's not super duper difficult, you know, but you still don't want to leave it up to the last minute to get to get it done, okay. So keep working on that one too. All right, so we are done. I'm gonna stop the recorder, and I'll see you guys on Wednesday.